they are now coming forward, certain members saying we were ordered to stand down. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics. And today we have a special show because, as you can see, warming up there over in the bullpen is one of our <laughs> most popular guests on the show, the great Dr. Jim Willie, editor of the Hat Trick Letter, which can be found on the golden jackass.com. And someone who has been tracking a lot of these economic shifts that have been taking place for decades and more and more by the day seem to rapidly being approaching the point where it's not a matter of talking about, well, one day this or that could happen, but seems like we're at that day, certainly in terms of some of the financial developments, also as well as the geopolitical developments, which as people are well aware at this point, we have a rather unfortunate conflict heating up in the Middle East so plenty to talk about today and excited to have Jim back on the show. So Jim, great to have you here. And how are you doing over there, my friend? I'm doing pretty well. I, as I tell folks, the important objective is not to be happy, not to thrive, but to get through the day and to survive. And that rhymes. Um, I'm oh. sorry, I'm, I'm blinded a bit by your handsome visage. I'm, <clears throat> I'm having a hard time with that. Um, <laughs> isn't it interesting that the Ukraine war is winding down and we got a new good war going? Now, I, I, I don't want anybody to criticize me for calling it a good war, but the cabal needs a war at all times. The cabal benefits from war material weapon contracts. They're the major shareholders. They benefit from aid. I learned this with the Iraqi Reconstruction Fund. I had suspicions that there would be some theft of the Reconstruction Fund, and there was. I think the majority of it was stolen. I believe that a good deal of the Ukraine aid is diverted to the Davos crowd, the cabal. And a lot of the arms end up in the black market. I'm going to touch, and I call it an executive summary. I've got that ability in my background. Uh, when we did marketing research studies, we would produce a 30 or 50 page report. But the vice president's and some of their staff said, you got to put this in a three page or four page executive summary, because that's probably all I will read. And if I find something really interesting, I will dig into the back pages and look for some evidence like graphics, charts, etc. Got to summarize it for him, Jim. It's very hard to summarize. I'm going to do my best, but they needed a new war because they could not start one in the Sudan. They could not start one in Niger, Western Africa, for the Trans-Sahara Pipeline. Goes across the entire belt of Africa. All the nations on that belt have dismissed and removed the French military, every single country. Niger was the last. So they needed a, a war. Notice that it was about six or eight months ago, Israel donated a bunch of arms to Ukraine. And I believe that, this is my opinion, no money changed hands. The arms came back and went into the hands of Hamas. At the same time, some of the weapons in Afghanistan Remember, we left $5 billion worth of material. Some of that went to Israel. And then the Israeli Defense Force did a stand down order. They allowed an attack. And this is very complicated. There's so much more that could be described. The Israeli Defense Fund is called the IDF. 
they are now coming forward, certain members saying we were ordered to stand down and they're talking anonymously. There are some members of the IDF who are retired, like a woman who did a, a, a quick video. She said not a grain of rice could cross the border without being detected. Okay, so this was a false flag. Netanyahu, nickname of Bibi, B-I-B-I for Benjamin Netanyahu Bibi. Bibi has been in trouble now for two years politically. And this is a very convenient method of rallying the troops behind Bibi. Nobody is talking now about removing Bibi from power. In addition, we had the Jerusalem Post. They did a poll and 86% loosely described, responded that it was a false flag event, that it was Israel doing it against itself to motivate retaliation against Gaza. There's another angle. And I brought this up in 2015, and it caused a permanent rift with me and Greg Hunter. Uh, Greg Hunter has not responded to a single email of mine, nor has he invited me in eight years to be on a show because I reminded him that Israel is at the center of a five nation claim of the Leviathan oil and gas deposit, which is worth many, many billions and is a motive behind some of the occupation and conflict in Syria. Palestine is one of the nations involved in the Leviathan oil and gas claims. I believe that there are many parties, including a Rothschild company, that would like to see Palestine removed from having any claims. There's actually some, what do you call it, state-of-the-art technology for a platform that is not anchored to the Mediterranean. It's called the Tamar, T-A-M-A-R, floating platform. So they've got a floating platform drilling gas. And ironically, it feeds into the Gazprom Russian network. Okay, this is a very complex issue. It's not possible to summarize it in 30 seconds. There's another angle to this, and it's from a Q drop. For those who find credibility with Q, and I do to some extent, I'm not a big Q flag waver, but yeah. it just way too many things that have been called that, that turned out to be part of our reality in the future. Um, a Q drop said that once the Israeli war begins, we're going to have a conversion process of the mainstream news in the West. And they call Israel the last war. That could be interpreted many, many ways. I'm not going to get involved in what the last war means. It could be just the end of the cabal as we know it, and it could be the end of the planet as we know it. I don't know. I'm not going to get involved in that debate. Okay, I know I'm leaving out some things. Um, this is a very complex issue. Remember that a lot of Israeli citizens were forced into a vaccine mandate. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are some health issues as a result. I don't want to discuss that whole issue, except to say that a lot of Israeli citizens do not find favor in Netanyahu. That's a, that's a, that's a tongue twister. Bibi. I don't like Bibi. I'm under the impression that it might not be the original Bibi, but we'll leave that for a future discussion because that might come out very soon. Wait a minute. You're not Bibi. Um, there's going to be dissension, I believe, in the Israeli military. There's already begun, it's already begun to some extent. Um, the retaliation and consequences, what do you want, what do you call that? Uh, the imp blowback. The blowback input could be severe. 
uh, Saudi Arabia, and I believe UAE, they're joined at the hip. Uh, they have claimed that if the violence doesn't stop, that there will be a cutoff of oil supply to Europe and the West. So we could be seeing a repeat of the 73 oil embargo. The price of oil has responded. Um, if oil goes up, I think it will drag gold with it. Um, but that's very complicated. I tell you, this is very, very messy. Um, my opinion is that Hamas is under Langley control and Obama orders and Hezbollah is under Iranian control and orders and ISIS is under Israeli control and orders. So the three groups, groups Hamas, Hezbollah, and Israel. It's extremely messy. And I'm amazed at the stories coming out of Israel that indicate that it was a false flag by their own leaders. I'm also amazed that there is not a media blackout for coverage. There was talk about that, but it did not occur. Unlike Maui, that's completely shut down. Maui, Hawaii, United States of America. Oh, I'm sorry, United Socialist States of America. Um, Thanks. Th thanks for bringing that up again. Appreciate it. Yeah. That. Okay. We're, we're not going to get through this quickly. Uh, Turkey has assigned and deployed some special forces in the Gaza. Um, Egypt has attempted to make a lot of food and water support for the Gaza. And um, elements of the Israeli military have said anything goes. There'll be no tribunals for atrocities or whatever. Um, I could go on, Chris, but there is more that I wish not to address. Um, having to do with the citizens and their particular makeup in Israel. This is extraordinarily complex. It is multi-sided. Uh, there's some talk about, you know, migrating to Ukraine. I, I don't know. I don't know. I almost don't care, but I do care. I don't have a single dog in the fight, not a single friend in Israel. And I have talked personally with at least one Israeli citizen. And I was shocked that that Israeli citizen told me point blank, Jim, most of the citizens in my country know that that was a false flag by Netanyahu. He wants war. He wants violence. That is from an Israeli client. Okay? Not from me. Um. I regard the entire topic of Israel, Judaism, and whatever, a third rail, and I avoid it. Yeah, and we don't have to dig too much more into that, and I appreciate your sensitivity on the issue as just tragic all around and a lot of loss of life already. Um, just one last thing, and you can tell me if you'd like to comment this on this or not, but... We're recording on Tuesday, the 17th, and late last night before going to bed, there were reports that Iran was basically issuing some stern warnings if the response into Gaza was not stopped immediately. Any comment on that and give the possibility of further escalation there? Well, the risk is calling in Hezbollah troops and they are not Mickey Mouse military outfit. Hezbollah, for those who don't know it, I believe is Persian for party of God. So they are like jihadists. Um, they're fierce. They're well-trained. And I'm told that a lot of them are kind of seal level, but I don't believe that. 
I believe they're just probably well-disciplined, uh, well-trained military personnel. Uh, I truly believe that Hamas is under U.S. control with assistance by Israel. I truly believe that without much of any equivocation. There have been accusations that Iran was party to this attack, but I believe it was mostly Hamas under control by Langley and Obama, that Obama gang that we keep hearing about. Uh, I have told that Persia, the Iranians had some kind of a connection uh, with infiltration into a database and, and certain storage centers, data centers in high ranking military units of the Israeli military. I, I don't know if that's true or not, could be. Um, I have been told by a military source that Iran funded the Hamas, and I don't believe that. I believe that military source is speaking uh, out of his own opinion without any evidence. Um, I said this in the very beginning. I believe the weapons for Hamas came from Afghanistan and Ukraine without any money changing hands. Why do we leave so many weapons behind in Afghanistan? Why do we keep funding a losing effort in Ukraine? It's not about winning a war anymore. I think it's about clearing out the Ukrainian population. And I, I believe it's down about 30%. <clears throat> Some people think, oh gosh, they must be all dead by now. No, 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 don't be ridiculous. There are civilians in cities. And I believe the worst of the worst for the money laundering centers and the other trafficking units and research centers in Ukraine are under Kiev. I don't believe any money changed hands and therefore I don't believe Iran was responsible for anything except cheerleading, which could be considered a serious offense in itself. <clears throat> this is very, very complicated. Notice that in Israel, they regard it as a false flag. Outside Israel, in the West, they're calling it atrocities by Hamas against innocent Israeli citizens and military personnel. I regard Western press, for those who don't know much about geometry, I'm going to lay it on you. I believe most of the MSM press is 160 to 180 degrees off the truth which means they're very close to the direct opposite of being true. I take an MSM story, I turn it completely around, and I run with that, which is usually verified in the following weeks. <clears throat> so, what is the MSM press doing? They're blasting it all over every single day, except in Germany where they talk about climate change. Well, of course, there is that. Oh, by the way, I, I got a German client. He said, a big election in Germany and the independent party overwhelmingly beat out Chancellor Schultz and his party. We may be seeing some pressure for change in the chancellery of Germany. That's their executive branch. They call their president the chancellor. The independent party won a big victory yesterday. I follow Germany because I think they're going to flip. When they do, it's going to be like a giant turning. It will mean Russian energy contracts. It will mean removal of NATO. It will be the propaganda news in Germany completely going silent. It will be the Langley boys being booted out. End of NATO, end of Langley, end of pro-Ukraine. I watch little, little hints like a German soccer football team playing a Ukrainian team. And they are buddy, buddy, 
hugs, nodding heads, everything. Tremendous sympathy for Ukraine without the recognition that it is the European trafficking center. Well, there sure are a lot of heavy things going on in the world and not surprising that there's a lot of changes taking place. Um, of course, behind all of this, we have a lot of the financial trends, which I know you dig into quite a bit as well. And interesting, again, we're recording on Tuesday the 17th, where after seeing a bit of a relief rally over the past week or so since things flared up in Israel, the U.S. bond market having a rather particularly difficult day with the yield up 14 basis points. Here's the one month chart we see back here during the Fed's last meeting, 10 year yield at 433, let's call it. So 50 basis points higher, which has happened in just under a month. And we got up to the uh, 488 level about a week and a half ago, came back in and really surging again today. Not not ideal conditions, uh, especially with so much supply coming onto the market in the next couple of years. And I don't know if we've gotten to the point yet where that's really becoming a concern on a bigger level, although seems like it's a fine boundary between when people are just worried about the Fed and inflation and when they do become concerned about the supply on a bigger level. Obviously, many other areas around the globe have expressed that concern. Uh, not sure if we're seeing that so much in the U.S. just yet, but I know in your last newsletter, you certainly wrote plenty about the U.S. Treasury market. So perhaps I'll let you take it from there. When we get over 5%, the alarm bells will go off. I've read many, many assessments of the bond damage. Keep this in mind. The Federal Reserve is a big investor in Treasury bonds, but they do not use leverage. They don't, they don't use margin debt to amplify their investments. In other words, they don't, they don't buy three times or five times as much bonds as they have capital. They're one to one. That leverage abuse is with the big banks. And I've heard it said that compared to the bonds that were purchased several years ago, the losses are between 35 and 50%. When they raised interest rates, the old bonds really went down hard in value. Let's just keep some simple napkin math. Let's just say that a bond portfolio by a big Wall Street bank went down 30%. But what if they're 10 to 1 leverage? That means they went down 300%. And 10 to 1 leverage, that's not a lot for those casino managers. Most of the Wall Street banks are insolvent, which means their assets don't cover their liabilities. So if they lose their liquidity, if the cash flow starts drying up, they have to declare bank failure. So far, that has not happened. The Fed comes to the rescue in the middle of the night. The bond losses are horrendous. And I'm not even talking about commercial real estate and mortgages that have gone into default and gone into deep arrears, but the commercial real estate market is in the news very often and has been for six months. I first learned about commercial real estate troubles back in at about the same time Silicon Valley hit the news in February. The next month it was commercial real estate, CRE. I already knew what the acronym meant from the layman days. <clears throat> Every class of U.S. bank has exposure to commercial real estate losses. It includes the smallest of banks. I made an error, Chris, and I, I admit errors. I said back in the spring, you know, April, March, 
that the safest banks would be the smallest banks with, say, exposure to two or three states at most, small regional banks. They're not exactly safe because they've got commercial real estate loans. Okay, even like in a small, I, I love, you know, Podunk, Indiana, Terre Haute, Indiana. Even in a little city like that, they're damaged to commercial real estate and the banks that are holding the bag there are typically small. Okay, so small banks have real estate mortgage and lending risk. The regional banks, I've got good news. Um, the regional banks are not being gobbled up by Wall Street, by the designated hitter, JP Morgan. And I may have mentioned this before, but it's worth repeating. There's a lot that's worth repeating. Janet Harlot Yellen, I'm sorry, Janet, is that her name? Janet Harlot, yeah, Janet Harlot Yellen announced in April that she wanted JP Morgan to be the official super bank to introduce credit scoring, CBDC, and all that lovely fascist banking policy. <clears throat> but after absorbing First Republic and First Heritage, along with Silicon Valley and a couple of other smaller ones, they got an insolvency indigestion problem. And I raised the question, Chris, what happens when a giant insolvent bank acquires a smaller insolvent bank? Fixes everything. Well, they don't cancel out. What you get is a magnified, what do you call it? A nonlinear response. Um, and, you know, I'm a math guy, so nonlinear response, they, they give me small goof bumps. Um, <clears throat> I got to give you one little sidetrack. This is fun. This is, this is statistics. It's modeling and it's fun. If you graph the four minute mile, I'm sorry, you graph the mile. Sorry. If you graph the time for the mile and you graph it by the year, then you get a declining slope that looks like it might have a limit. Okay, we're never gonna get to a one minute mile. But when I was a kid, the big issue was, are they gonna, are they gonna get under a four minute mile? Okay? Because one minute per quarter mile is kind of standard and I could never come anywhere near that. I was like a minute 20. Um, if you graph with, the horizontal being the year and the vertical being the record, the world record for the, the, the mile, then it looks like it's leveling out. And if you can do an exponential model of that, it's nonlinear regression and it's not simple. And, and we came up with, with estimates in a model. I remember like it was yesterday, three minutes, 50 seconds. Look, looks like it's the limit. And, I don't think we've beaten that even now, but there's a very interesting phenomenon. Back in the 60s, black American athletes were not very much in the picture. Now they are, and they are speedy, speedy people. Okay, that's my little nonlinear side story. Um, I, I love mathematics. I get yayas from it. Um, I do these little problems. I got it in my closet. I got about 30 special problems that were solved. And my dad thought that I should make a, a little book for high school students, you know, an auxiliary side book, you know, you buy it for 25 bucks and, you know, 30% profit for Jim Willie. <clears throat> anyway, I've never done it cause I'm pretty darn busy. Um, all right, back to the bond market. They must continue to hike interest rates. They have no choice. They are liars. They're saying that it's to bring down price inflation. They are liars. It is in response to price inflation 
because bond investors will not buy a bond that has an immediate negative real return. They're not doing it to bring down price inflation. In fact, raising interest rates will do harm to any recovery for the supply chain. It will continue to worsen price inflation. At the same time, we're doing unsterilized monetization of our debt. Translate to English, Jim. At the same time, we're printing money in order to buy bonds that are issued in order to finance our government deficit. By not draining the bank industry, it's called unsterilized. The result is instant inflation on a monetary side that works its way across the market and economy. They're not raising interest rates to bring down price inflation. It's because of price inflation and they cannot afford a bond auction failure. They've already had a close failure in August. I'm sure you were watching some of that. I, I'm of the opinion, Chris, that there was backdoor, under the table, money handed to the US allies to buy the treasury bonds, which were quickly returned back to the US treasury. We had a hidden, underhanded self-dealing where we bought our own bonds and essentially gave credit to our allies for their support of the US government debt. And the bullshit story for that is foreign investors are buying the U.S. bonds because they're offering a higher bond yield now. No, they're dumping the Treasury bonds because they're losing value greatly, and they're not buying because they never expect ever, ever to be repaid. We're in the middle of a bond default, Chris. I'll stake my reputation on it. I believe we, were, we have been in a bond default for over two years. That doesn't mean we stop issuing and selling bonds. It means we don't admit it. And all the damage is hidden. Like Long Beach that does not accept treasury bills for payment to the foreign shippers. They don't expect, ac accept treasury bills. And well, wait a minute. There's news stories out of Long Beach that we got a strike. Yes, yes. We've got a false story that there's a dock worker strike. And they were told to go on strike by Langley. Because the Treasury bill is not accepted. And that's not a story that will be told. Yeah, I'm sure we're not going to hear a lot about the things that are happening with the the treasury market where likely be propped up until it can't be propped anymore. Although, what are you expecting out of the Fed where, you know, we've heard a lot of talk about one more hike than with the bond yields rising over the past month. Now it seems to be, well, maybe the market has done the Fed's job for it. Again, at the same time, you have the inflation numbers take them as you will, but still the inflation numbers that they're producing starting to tick back up again, along with higher oil, which, as you mentioned before, some of these higher interest rates are knocking supply chains offline, certainly seems to be happening in the oil market. So quite a tricky position that that leaves things in. And Chris, we're going to continue to raise interest rates and we might have longer pauses, but we're gonna to continue to raise interest rates or else we're gonna face the embarrassment of a bond auction failure. They gotta to continue to raise interest rates. They, they are of the belief that a higher bond yield will attract buyers. It didn't work in August. And you're talking about the Fed specifically there or just the market? raising the longer end of the bond curve. I'm talking about the Fed and, and you know, Fed funds and, and interest rate hikes from the official side, the low end. Um, the long end the quarter and go past that. I, I think if you look back at their past statements, almost nothing made any sense. Almost nothing was 
nothing occurred as it was laid out. They're, they're trying to produce calm in the bond market. They'll do and say anything to produce calm. I don't give a damn about their words. I don't think that they tell the truth. I don't think they ever tell the truth. And I think we learned in the Patriot Act and the Financial Regulatory Bill of 2008, Dodd-Frank, lying as national policy is good business. They're liars. I don't, I don't dissect the nonsense of their words. I laugh and I work towards something that's important, not the FOMC bullshit. Do you remember what the bullshit was in the 90s? Well, how thick is Greenspan's suitcase? Okay, that was the bullshit back then. The bullshit has never stopped. And I don't get locked in to the bullshit. What I look at is what was the record that was set in June and July for foreign central bank dumping of treasury bonds? And then we heard a story that China, Brazil, and Saudi sold $19 billion worth, I think, I think it was August. And they think that's a lot. Well, it's not. You want a lot? You got to look in Japan. Why is not Japan in the news? Because they're an ally. Why don't we get told that Japan sold almost $200 billion of treasury bonds in a 12 month period ending in October of 2022? Because they're an ally. Because there is where we see the evidence of what happens when a foreign central bank sends sells a boatload, not a truckload, a boatload of treasury bonds. The yen went down, Chris, 23% in 12 months. And the BRICS nations are watching. Okay, this is almost hilarious, but it's tragic. It, it's interesting, it's intriguing, it's paradoxical. The Japanese are showing us what happens if they do an Operation Sandman. You wreck your domestic financial system. You cause a domestic credit crisis, and you don't get out of it. Japan has been stuck in it now for close to a year, like eight or nine months. They're not getting out of it because with the, de the decline in their currency, the foreign holders of Japanese government debt, called the JGB, Japanese government bond, JAGS, the JGBs went down in value, so foreigners dumped it. And the Japanese had to print money to do further damage to their yen currency in order to buy their own debt. And they've not gotten out of the crisis. And during all this, they're buying gold. The Japanese Central Bank, BOJ, Bank of Japan, they're buying gold hand over fist. With a lot of different consequences like assassinations by the good old boys, the globalists, Rothschilds. The Rockefellers, assassinations of mid-level Japanese officials whose names you've never heard of. And you probably couldn't even pronounce if you did hear them. The Japanese are giving us the lesson of what happens if you do Operation Sandman. So I'm doing, I'm making a forecast. I'm calling it the Jackass Operation Sandman forecast. Two years of steady Endless dumping of treasury bonds by foreign central banks, friends, enemies, and marginal nations. For those who don't know, France is dumping treasury bonds. While Japan dumped 180 billion, France dumped 70 billion. I thought they're our friend. Uh huh. The central banks are going to manage their own insolvency. They're all damaged by holding too many treasury bonds during this interest rate hike sequence that will not stop. We're going to see the dollar rise, rise, then rise some more before it vanishes. I've been saying that now off and on for over seven years. 
I've gotten more compliments regarding that and a few other forecasts in the last year than I have the last 10 years. We're starting to see the Eurasian trade zone arrive in the form of BRICS. We're starting to see the gold trade note in the form of either the gold trade, I'm sorry, the gold token of the BRICS or their new development bank note. The currency that we saw for the BRICS is not the gold token. That is a bank note for the BRICS new development bank. You got that currency? Very good. Oh, you got that right out of my report, didn't you? I was ready for you. Now, on the back side, you have all the different other nations. I see Argentina. Um, some of them I don't recognize. Zimbabwe, Mexico, Bolivia. Um, okay, I, I had a an incident. It was like a two-week conversation with a fellow from Africa. And uh, he was a smart guy. But he had a couple of holes in his perceptions. And he had he had met some people in Kenya, royals in Kenya, royals in Congo. Um, he had met uh, in Namibia, Zimbabwe. And here's something that, that came out during our conversations. He said, Jim, we're going to see an example given and shown and demonstrated with the gold token. And the BRICS nations are paying attention because Zimbabwe is going to issue it, use it, and make it well known. And and we didn't have a good phone connection. He said, Zimbabwe. And I said, where? Zambia? He said, no, Zimbabwe. The second B in Zimbabwe is silent. It's Zimbabwe. For those who want to get it right. <clears throat> He believes that Zimbabwe is going to be a gold and diamond wealth center and create what could turn out to be essentially an African central bank that will be gold and diamond backed. Not currency backed, but the bank will be backed by it. The central bank will be loaded with gold and diamonds. And they're going to do development bank loans with their neighbors and then far and wide. Far and wide could go all the way to Egypt, go all the way to Nigeria. <clears throat> That's it. And that is now a legitimate denomination for a bank account in Zimbabwe. They're urged to convert their dollars to gold token in Harare, the capital. This is going to get very interesting, but I, I got a, a very important point to make regarding Israel, the war, the distraction, the violence, and it's all horrible. Loss of life, a lot of loss of life. <clears throat> Here's the point. BRICS has been now distracted by this conflict. This is one of the points I forgot to mention, but I, it, it came back and now that we're on this topic. <clears throat> Iran and Saudi Arabia were making nice along with UAE and Oman and Qatar and Kuwait. All those countries were making nice. And the Iranians were opening their embassy in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. A lot of that is put on hold now. There are a lot of BRICS projects that are put on hold now. But what is not on hold and will continue on its tragic and merry way is the de-dollarization, the dumping of treasuries, and the non-usage of the dollar in trade settlement. The BRICS are distracted, but nobody is delaying in any way, shape, or form 
the de-dollarization. So there is part one of this interview with Jim Willie, where obviously he talked about some of the heavy things that are happening in the world, and especially in Israel, of course, in addition to the de-dollarization, which continues amidst all that's happening. Of course, in the past 24 hours since this was recorded on Tuesday, the 17th, we did have the reports of the hospital in Gaza being blown up and now debate going on today over who was actually behind that. So certainly some tragic events happening in the world and just sending prayers to everyone involved in hopes that people are safe and staying well out there, even though I know that is unfortunately not so much the case right now. But either case, in part two, which will be coming your way in just a couple of days, Jim talks a bit more about the economics and what is happening in gold and silver and how he sees that playing out in response to the strenuous conditions in the U.S. Treasury market. So again, that'll be coming your way in just a couple of days. And one last note before we wrap up is that this episode was brought to you today by Miles Franklin. And certainly if you are purchasing gold and silver at this point and interested in adding to your silver stack in particular, they are currently running a special for silver one ounce Morgan rounds at only $2.09 over spot. You can find out more about that or place an order by emailing Arcadia at Miles Franklin. Happy to get back to you with information or if you do have any questions about any of the things we're discussing on the show, look forward to talking with you there. Again, that's Arcadia at Miles Franklin. With that said, going to wrap up for today, but just hope you're staying safe out there and doing well, and I will see you again tomorrow.